start now. Um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Adel Mana um, to our last, uh, fifth and last conversation uh, within the framework of encounters, uh, which is a joint a, a program by the Institute of Holocaust Genocide and Memory Studying at UMass Amherst, headed by Professor Alon Confino and the Institute Abraham Harman Research Institute for Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, unfortunately, Alon uh, is still facing some medical problems and will not be able to lead in the conversation with me and uh, talk with uh, Dr. Mana, but we all wish him a refuah a full recovery and speedy, speedy and full recovery. Uh, before I start introducing uh, our speaker, I will just say a few words about how, housekeeping rules. Um, so the event is recorded. Uh, please note that the event is recorded and you can then watch it on the uh, Amherst, uh, the, uh, Amherst in uh, Institute YouTube channel. You can also, uh, you can also uh, follow both institutes on Facebook and on the website. Um, we will clo uh, shortly close the chat box, so, but you are most encouraged to add to post questions as we speak and after we open it to question but also as we speak in the q a uh, box now where uh, i will introduce uh, dr mana uh, dr adel mana is a palestinian historian specializing in history of palestine during the ottoman and the uh, 20th century uh, his last last book which we'll be talking about this uh, afternoon or evening, Nakba and Survival, uh, the story of Palestinians who remained in Haifa and Galilee 1948-1956, was published lately in 2022 in English by California University Press. The book was published already in Arabic uh, in Beirut 2016 and in Hebrew by the Van Leer Institute 2017. Um, uh, Mana published uh, nine more books in uh, his field of speciality and about 50, 40 articles in Arabic, Hebrew, and English journals, as well as edited books. He taught since the early 1980s in the Hebrew University and in Birzeit University. Currently, he is a senior research fellow at the Jerusalem Van Leer Institute. And as we, a whole program this year, and as I said, this is the last encounter. Our whole program dealt with the aftermath. We are very happy to host you here, uh, Adel, on your book on the after on the Nakba and its aftermath. So uh, the first question that we ask everybody is, uh, can you present the book in most general terms? And what are the main uh, claims that you make in this book for an audience that still haven't read the book? And just give, an, give us an idea, what do you actually, what does it actually deal with? Uh, yeah, good evening for everybody. Uh, uh, and thank you, Amos, uh, for your kind and generous introduction. Uh, allow me, before answering your question, uh, to say that I'm grateful and thankful for uh, this opportunity uh, to speak to this special audience in the uh, encounter program uh, and to join your wishes uh, for better health to our friend and colleague uh, Alon Confino. Uh, now back to your uh, question. Uh, this book, Nakba and Survival, is telling the story of Palestinians who remained in Haifa uh, and the Galilee eventually, which means that some of them, most of them remained during the war of 48, but others 
uh, were pushed out, were expelled, and succeeded to return uh, to their homes or to the Galilee, at least, sometimes not to their homes and villages, but to the Galilee, and became Israeli citizens uh, since uh, 1948 9 or the year they, that in which they succeeded to return. Now, this is a, an account uh, of the realities of those people uh, during the Nakba, 1948, and after, in the decade uh, after, until uh, the year 1956, sometimes uh, even more, until the uh, 1958. Uh, I'm telling the story of those people uh, who remained there uh, from different sources that probably will speak more about uh, those sources, particularly oral history, uh, which is very important addition to the other written uh, sources. Uh, it's a kind of uh, field research, uh, which is uh, not used by historians uh, many times. Uh, I went uh, to the area, to the villages, I spoke to people, and many times after speaking to the people and listening to their stories, uh, I found uh, local sources like memoirs, documents, uh, and other so uh, written sources that if I was writing my book, uh, depending only on archives and books and other uh, sources in the library, in the university, I, would, I will not uh, find those local sources, not to speak about the oral history uh, itself. If, if I add uh, the, uh, to this description that the book is composed of an introduction, uh, and seven chapters. The first two chapters uh, are telling the story of the occupation uh, and survival uh, in the Lower Galilee first, uh, and Nazareth in the center and its villages. And then the second chapter is about Upper Galilee, the occupation of Upper Galilee uh, on late October 48, early uh, uh, November. Uh, then I move uh, to speak about uh, the survival after the war and speak about the communists in the third chapter, which we will speak probably about them more later. Uh, and then about their day-to-day -day realities from their own point of view. I'm not speaking uh, much about the policies toward uh, the Palestinians in Israel, toward the Arab citizens, because most of the research on the Arabs in Israel uh, is dealing with the policies toward the Palestinians. I decided uh, to let the Palestinians tell their story and uh, 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 those silent people or marginalized people uh, tell their story, or at least I'll, I am telling their story from their point of view, uh, how they succeeded uh, to live those uh, difficult years uh, after uh, the war. Uh, thank you, Adel. So 1948 was obviously a major catastrophe for the Palestinian people, a major blow where uh, most of the, the population under uh, within the Israeli state either fled or expelled or a combination of both were uh, encouraged to uh, fl uh, flee. But you start the book with uh, some personal stories which are very um, moving but also teaching. Now, I don't ask you to repeat all of them because uh, it will take uh, the whole program, the whole uh, all hour. But if you can choose shortly one or two and explain why did you start with your own story, with your own family story? Uh, probably without my <clears throat> family story or private story, uh, this book will, will not be uh, published or written uh, at all. 
Uh, and I start the, with a turning point in my life to my mind, uh, which influenced uh, my future uh, and maybe also made me choose to study history. And I'm speaking about uh, uh, the year 1958. Uh, it was spring, late uh, April 48, when I was 10, 10 years old. Uh, and in our school uh, that year, like in many other or all Arab schools in Israel, they were forced to celebrate a decade, 10 years, uh, to the establishment of the state of Israel. As a kid, uh, I loved that week of celebrations. Uh, I preferred it like other kids uh, on the boring uh, teachings of the, of the teachers, what they taught us. Uh, and uh, in the principal day of celebration, uh, the parents were asked to come and see their children celebrating. And uh, let's remind you and others that it was military control and uh, uh, not accepting that invitation and not uh, showing up was a problem uh, for those parents. So my father did come uh, to that day uh, and uh, I celebrated with others and I had uh, uh, two uh, roles in, in the celebration and uh, after the celebration, uh, I thought my father will say, bravo kid, uh, you played well or did this well. And he said nothing. And a few days uh, after that incident, I uh, encouraged myself to ask him, uh, are you mad on me, dad? And he, he didn't understand from where that question comes. See, so he said, did you do something bad that I should be mad on you? He didn't think about the celebration of independence a few days ago. And then I reminded him and he said, ah, uh, 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 independence of Israel. Kid, it wasn't istiklal, it wasn't independence for us. It was istihlal, it was occupation. It was a catastrophe. And he told me for the first time, I mean, it was the first time that I heard what happened in our village to our family in 48. And in short, he told me uh, how the army made a massacre in the village a week after uh, 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 the occupation of the village, actually surrender rather than occupation of the village. And then three months later, uh, the army came again. The people were afraid that uh, it could be a second massacre. But this time, the army came to expel people from the village. Uh, and we, our family, small family, my father, my mother, and myself as a kid, one year old, were expelled from the village by trucks and buses of the army. And we made a, a whole tour uh, from uh, the borders uh, with Jordan in Wadi Ara, uh, near Umm al-Fahim, uh, Ara and Arara, uh, to Nablus, and from there to East Jordan, to Syria, to Lebanon. And we lived in Lebanon for two years, or more than two years, uh, particularly in Ain al-Hilwe refugee camp, and came back uh, only in summer, July uh, 51. So that story, uh, you know, haunted me. And I kept thinking uh, about what could happen uh, to Adil, the kid, if he was staying with the, his family in Lebanon as a refugee, uh, if my father didn't uh, dare, uh, you know, to come back uh, to the Galilee by sea, uh, by the way, uh, and become again a, a resident of the village of uh, Marzal Krum. Uh, and then I learned more and more, but th this in short, this story, I, uh, and the question that asked my, uh, my father, why our teachers are telling us a totally different narrative 
about what happened in 48 and what Israel is doing just good for the Palestinians. And why, that's why they should celebrate with the Jews in Israel uh, the establishment of, uh, of the state and then all you know, the good things that uh, the state is doing and the, the state is flourishing for all its citizens and so on and so forth. And I learned that uh, uh, from my father that, and others that teachers should teach the Zionist narrative. Otherwise, they will be kicked out uh, from a teaching job. So, so this uh, family story, I think, uh, uh, the seeds for this book uh, were uh, back there in 1958, and I decided to, to draw a, to a, a share a, this story with the readers in order to say, without telling the whole story, as you said, a, a, what is my positionality from where this book stems? Uh, why I'm writing uh, this book. I felt when my father told me this story and I kept asking questions and hearing other parts of the story that my father, my family are telling me, if you will be educated, you can go and tell the story because uh, my father and my mother are almost illiterate. My mother fully illiterate. My father was uh, just learned a little bit uh, two, two years or three years in school. So they are not able to tell the story. Uh, and I, 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 I thought that they are telling me the story in order to be able to tell it later. But it took a long time until I did it, uh, as you said uh, earlier. Sorry, I'm not hearing you. Yeah, I'm saying now let's jump in into the content. And one of the claims you make in the, it, it, as you explained before, there are several parts, but part, one is the major, the major claims you make in the book, which is very controversial and also very, I would say, tense political, that there was a policy, Israeli policy of ethnic cleansing in the Galilee and actually beyond. Why do you say that and how do you, what do you actually mean? What do you, why do you say that and how do you uh, base your claim? Well, to begin with, I'm, I'm basing my claim on the Zionist position uh, toward the Palestinians uh, from the beginning and at least uh, after the Balfour Declaration. Uh, the Balfour Declaration uh, gave the Jewish side who were a minority, less than 2% at that time, gave them the uh, right of self-determination, national rights in Palestine, without giving the same rights to the Palestinians who were more than 90% of the population. And since this declaration uh, was actually written uh, one way or another uh, by British and Zionists, as we know, uh, it resembled the Zionist attitude toward Palestinians uh, that uh, the land of Israel is the, for the people of Israel or that uh, uh, this land, Palestine, land of Israel, is a vacant uh, a land for a people who don't have a homeland, the Jews. And uh, during the British mandate and before, the Zionist uh, movement never recognized the right on, of the Palestinians on their homeland. And when they were asked, what shall they do with the Palestinians? And as, 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 uh, as people who just came lately uh, to this land, who immigrated to Palestine, like other immigrants from Europe to different parts of the world earlier in the 16th up to the 19th century, uh, the Zionist movement uh, didn't, or the leaders of the Zionist movement, did not give uh, real answers to what shall they do uh, to the majority of the people, how they will uh, 
turn Palestine from a land uh, settled by a majority, vast majority of Palestinians to a land settled by majority of Jews. And this is important, particularly uh, on the eve of 48. Uh, <clears throat> the Ben-Gurion and uh, Jewish leaders uh, started uh, to think about transfer uh, and about ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, in particular after 37. Uh, the appeal a uh, plan division of Palestine into a tiny Jewish state and Arab uh, uh, part of uh, Palestine, which is most of the land. Uh, and in that appeal uh, plan, uh, the Jewish side again is getting self-determination. They establish a state as tiny as it is, but it's a state for the Jewish side. And the Arabs, the Palestinians are not getting self-determination and establishing a Palestinian state, but rather they were supposed to be under the control uh, of government of uh, King Abdullah or Amir Abdullah, Prince Abdullah, who is controlled by the British. So, so it means that, that the Palestinian side will continue to be under a colonial, a, a colonial a government of the British and a, their a, a guy, in, a, a Abdullah in, in Amman. Now, a, on the eve of, a, on the, eve of, a, of the war in 47, more than two thirds of the population were Palestinians. Uh, and less than one third of the population uh, was Jewish. Without ethnic cleansing, without pushing the Palestinians outside of Palestine, which is, there is no discussion that this was a, 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 the aim to, to have a majority uh, of Jews uh, in the state of Israel, without pushing Palestinians to outside Palestine by one way or another, uh, the uh, Zionist side will not have a Jewish majority. And then the book tells the story how the Jewish side uh, did that, particularly in the Galilee, but uh, sometimes uh, elsewhere. And uh, the war was very important event for Israel in order to enable the Jewish leadership, the Zionist leadership, uh, uh, to come to that aim of having Palestine without most of the Palestinians, and then having a majority of Jews uh, in the state of Israel, which was established uh, in May 48. And the, the whole story, the whole two uh, uh, par uh, chapters uh, uh, are telling the story how Israel did that uh, before the occupation, of Nazareth and lower, uh, lower Galilee, in different parts of the Galilee and elsewhere. And then the second chapter uh, in particular, uh, uh, occupation of Upper Galilee and how uh, the Israeli army did everything possible to push those who were left outside of Palestine by massacres, by a, a, a expulsion, I mean direct expulsion by the army, like in Martyr Tomb uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and but, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, can, yeah can I think so. I, so, you. But you also tell the story of Nazareth. Why was Nazareth uh, exempt from this uh, from this fate? Yeah, thank you for this uh, important question. And I, I would enlarge even the the question and ask uh, why, I mean, why the Palestinians in the Galilee in general, not only in Nazareth, were left. I mean, the, the army could have uh, uh, expelled most of those who were remained in, in, in Nazareth and in, in the Galilee in general. Uh, I think that there were uh, several uh, uh, reasons for, for this. To begin with, uh, Nazareth is a, is a Christian uh, holy city for the Christians. 
And the Israeli leadership, we should start to speak about Israeli leadership ra rather than just Zionist or Jewish uh, from July on, were uh, sensitive and aware to, uh, of the reaction of European countries. They didn't care about what other countries in the third world would say, including uh, Muslim and Arab countries. They didn't care about that, but they did care about support, political and other support from Western countries in Europe and the United States. Uh, so Nazareth as a, a, a holy Christian a city a, was sensitive issue. And that's why it's the only place in the history of 1948 in which Ben-Gurion gave orders to the officers of the army to occupy Nazareth peacefully and not to expel anybody there and that soldiers who will not obey those orders will be punished. We have nothing like this in any other city. A week earlier than uh, Nazareth when Ben-Gurion wanted uh, the army to expel uh, the people of Lidda and Ramle. We know exactly uh, how Ben-Gurion behaved when he was asked what to do with the civilians, what to do, to do with the people. And yeah, exactly, by his hand, he told, uh, because he generally didn't want to leave any documentation or orders for expulsion. He, 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 he was sure that the Yan, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, alone and others will understand what, it's, uh, what is you know, the common good uh, of the Zionist movement at this stage and what Ben-Gurion wants from them to do. Uh, while in, in Nazareth, when he wanted the army to behave differently, he had to, to give his orders in written and even to say that uh, uh, soldiers will be punished if, if they will not do that. Uh, so, uh, Lida and Ramle, uh, who, who remained after the first truce in June, uh, uh, Bingorion wrote in, in one place uh, that uh, two thorns are left in our butt between Jerusalem uh, and uh, Tel Aviv, which, and he meant Lida and Ramle. And we know what we do with uh, thorn, thorny or thorns in, in, in the butt that you get rid of them. And uh, when the time came and when the, 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 the war started again, uh, the orders were given uh, uh, to, to expel those people. And uh, the story of what happened uh, to Lida and Ramli is very uh, well known. And here I come to other reason to why Ben-Gurion behaved differently uh, or the lead Israeli leadership behaved differently in, uh, in Nazareth because after the, what happened in Lida and Ramle, uh, the, 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 there was a, a big fuss about uh, the Israeli uh, policy or policies, including by two Mapam uh, members of the government who criticized Ben-Gurion, how he allowed a such thing to happen. And uh, international media wrote about it from Jerusalem and from Ramallah because those refugees arrived to the West Bank and so on and so forth. So uh, this was uh, another reason that he couldn't, uh, you know, agree. I mean, he couldn't take on upon himself that something similar happened in a holy Christian city like Nazareth. And that's why he have to give a, a different order. But we can add also a, an issue of a, the, that Nazareth is not strategic or important for a, the Jewish state. It had to, a, I mean, to begin with, it should have been part of a, the Arab state, the Palestinian state rather than a Jewish state. And it's in the middle of the Galilee. Uh, and it's a tiny uh, city of less than 10,000 people at that time. So uh, as a tiny city and the only city who survived, uh, by the way, the only city who survived occupation in 48, a Palestinian city is, is Nazareth. 
So if we add to that, that communists in Nazareth and other, other collaborators like Sefi Dinezobi and his family uh, probably played a role in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, having this result. So we have uh, several uh, reasons, the geography, uh, the timing, uh, the, the holiness of the city uh, and other reasons uh, that uh, 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 Nazareth survived and other Palestinian cities uh, were destroyed in 48. So this is very interesting and the, the, the distinctions between the regional distinctions and the timing is makes, and maybe we will get back to it, what you hinted that not all were expelled, but a minority was allowed somehow to, to stay on, on in the villages. But let's move forward and, and after this big catastrophe, you, you, you start, you describe very vividly how do people cope with it. Uh, the first minutes the, 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 of the after the occupation and understanding that something dramatically changed and how to cope with it. So can you give us an example, maybe from your own village, Majd al Krum, what happened in the days after occupation how did it affect the, the Palestinian population? And how, what, what like the first days or even year to cope, to confront, to survive, as you call it, survival? What, what, so how this, like the, 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 the first year of, 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 from a Palestinian point of view of how to cope with it? And I just say that I start seeing, I, I see that start, people start, Posting question, I encourage you to already ask questions now in the Q and A. Uh, okay, go ahead, Adel. Okay, thank you, Amos. Um, the war uh, have stopped uh, at the end of '48 with the Arab armies, and then uh, ceasefire agreements uh, uh, or uh, were. Uh, 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 signed uh, with the near neighboring uh, Arab countries, starting by Egypt and ending by Syria in the first half of uh, 1949. However, uh, for the Palestinians who remained in Israel, the war actually did not stop, neither in the end of 48 nor uh, in 49. Uh, for uh, the Israeli leadership, uh, uh, this was a problem. They, they spoke about uh, the Palestinian problem in Israel or the Arab problem uh, in Israel. Uh, they, they started thinking that uh, actually uh, those uh, 120,000 uh, in the Galilee or 150 or 60,000 after uh, 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 that Jordan transferred the triangle uh, area to Israel, uh, they became 150 or 160,000. They should not have remained in Israel. It's, it's better to get rid of them. And that's why uh, the policy of uh, expulsion of people uh, from the Galilee and elsewhere uh, continued after 49. It continued in 49 and continued until 1956. I would like to uh, uh, just mention the expulsion of two villages in the Hula area in the north, two villages called Krad al Bakara and Krad al Ghannami. In the whole district of Safad, where uh, ethnic cleansing was almost full. I mean, most, the vast majority of the uh, people uh, who li were living in uh, Safad itself and uh, 70 or more than 70 villages around uh, Safad, most of them were expelled and only three or four villages remained. Two of them are in the Hula, uh, Krad al Bakara and Krad al Ghannami. Uh, the Israeli leadership uh, started speaking about uh, uh, you know, the uh, expulsion of the rest of the Palestinians who were remained in Israel in the second round of war. And they were waiting for a second round of war, which came in 56, as we know, in the Suez Canal War, uh, when Israel uh, 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 
colonized with the Britain, the colonial Britain and France, the, the last war, uh, colonial war in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, they thought uh, that uh, this time could be uh, an opportunity to expel more Palestinians from Israel. So in the North, Rabin, Ishaq Rabin, who was uh, the officer of the Northern uh, part of Israel, Aruf uh, Zafon, he wrote in his uh, memoirs uh, that we thought that Jordan or Syria will come to help Egypt in this war, and uh, then the soldiers will participate in the war and will have uh, to do something in that war. However, they did not, and the soldiers were bored. They had nothing to do. And I ordered them to expel the people of those two villages, uh, three to 4,000 people from their villages in 56, and they were expelled uh, to Syria and to Jordan. That's in the north. And in the south, as we know, uh, the massacre in Kufr Qasim, uh, which we know today that uh, the real aim of the massacre is not just killing the people, but frightening the people of Kufr Qasim and other villages uh, in their vicinity uh, in order to let them uh, flee uh, to the east, to the West Bank. Uh, so th those two incidents, uh, major incidents in 56, are part uh, of the continuous uh, uh, policy uh, of the uh, Israeli government after uh, 48 in order to get, to get rid at least uh, of part of the Palestinians who remained in Israel. You, you, but you describe um, a kind of uh, mixed situation or complex situation. On the one hand, there are citizens, they, those who remained or managed to somehow be included in the census uh, were citizens and they could appeal to the court on the one hand. And, but on the other hand, they were under martial law and discriminated are always uh, and oppressed, always uh, under the threat of another Nakba or another expulsion. So how did they uh, manage to, to take advantage of the, of the minimal rights that they did have? In, mm -hmm. For example, uh, to, to, to keep the lands or, and can you, can you describe this complex situation that they are, still citizens and can vote and can appeal to court and uh, in a, a, as if a democracy. And on the other hand, they are under martial law until 1966, under, as you, uh, uh, and under all kinds of uh, procedures of uh, uh, oppression, as you just explained. So this complex yeah. situation, yeah. can you yeah, explain? Thank you for uh, posing this question again to me. Uh, because it's important yeah, to try uh, to, to understand uh, what kind of life the people had at that time. I, I, should, start, uh, uh, I, I should start by saying that uh, actually uh, being citizens of Israel was something formal only because uh, no country uh, uh, put uh, 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 citizens of the country under martial law or under uh, military uh, government. Uh, so the fact that the Palestinians in Israel, uh, all of them, uh, whether in the south or in the north, were uh, under military government meant that the government actually did not think about them as real citizens of Israel. Uh, uh, and uh, this uh, military government continued, as we know, until December uh, 66. Now, under military control, and particularly in the early years uh, that I studied, the fear was the name of the game. The people were very afraid uh, from everything. It's not only uh, whether they will get a, 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 you know, a pass to go to work or to visit the city or to go to hospital or something like that. They were uh, afraid for their own existence in their village, on their land, in their houses. 
and a expulsion of Palestinians, uh, not only in 56, but between 49 and 56 continued. Uh, and uh, I assume that about 10,000 people, uh, Palestinians who remained were expelled during uh, those years until 56. While others, uh, more or less the same number uh, returned uh, to the country. Now, how, how, how they, how they uh, used uh, some of the benefits of democracy, everybody speaking about keeping the democracy in Israel, uh, and people uh, forget that uh, there was no democracy for the Palestinians since 1948, and not only from uh, today or after 67. Now, uh, uh, those people uh, uh, tried, for instance, uh, to use uh, the right of uh, uh, voting in order to get some benefits. So if the uh, ruling party, Mapai party, would come on the evening of the elections and tell uh, the uh, head of the village or a tribe that if they, all of them will vote to the government, they, for instance, will let a few people who are refugees from their tribe or their village come back and become citizens. That, and those people many times were expelled by, uh, by Israel in 48. So most of the people went and elected uh, the ruling party, Mapai party. Uh, 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 mo uh, the, the, the actually, the uh, options for uh, the Palestinians to vote were either voting for Zionist parties, mainly the Mapam, Mapai uh, ruling party, or to the communist. I mean, the only non-Zionist party was the communist party, who actually in a way was a kind of supporter of the Zionist uh, uh, idea of establishing a state, and we will come uh, to speak maybe later about the communists and what they did in 48. So, so even voting wasn't real for the Palestinians. It was a tool in their hands to try uh, to get something from their vote. The same thing with the, uh, with the other uh, institutions like, uh, you know, the Histadrut uh, and others, or- The, la the labor uh, you know, union. Yeah, the, the labor union, the Sadrut, uh, 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 and uh, what, the, what the survivors did is to try, you know, uh, to try and stick to the home and to the land. Uh, you mentioned the issue of land, of protecting their land, but actually they couldn't protect their land. If the government decided that they want a, a, a land of one village or more than one village in order to establish a, a Zionist a Jewish a settlements there, like Upper Nazareth near Nazareth or Carmel in the area of Bekat Beta Kerem Shagur in the middle of, of the Galilee, they, they, they just you know, took those lands a, it's military government and a, it, it was easy to do it as they are doing it in, in the West Bank today. The Palestinians under military control and Israel, the Israeli government is doing it in, in, the, uh, in the West Bank today. Uh, so, uh, and even uh, it's, it was worse, even your land, if, if the Israeli government decided that uh, this amount of land uh, which is thousands of dunam, is a military zone, and you have a land there, they criminalize you. If you go and uh, cultivate your land, you will, put me, you will be put in prison, or many times uh, uh, you endangered yourself, uh, because if you will be uh, shooted, or a mine there in the uh, military zone is exploded in you, it's your fault that you came to a military zone and so on and so forth. So, 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 so the life of people was a hell of life. And once again, just to summarize or to sum up, uh, uh, the fear was the, uh, played the main role in the, in the life of people during this period. And that's why 
Until 56, 57, uh, we had no one protest, no one demonstration, real demonstration against the policies of the Israeli government vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the Arabs in Israel. I'll ask one last question and then we perhaps then we move to the uh, Q and A. Um, okay. Uh, it will be a combined. I have two questions. One is uh, still you look at the. Uh, it's a combination of two questions. Uh, still you look at the Palestinians in uh, in the state of Israel as agents. They are. They have capabilities as limited as they are, and they use them. They are not just subjects of history, but they are active agents or objects yeah. of history. And this also connects to the, uh, your uh, using oral history as a major, so you hear the people, their stories and what they actually did. So if you can talk about those two elements shortly, uh, on, on the one hand, so why do you consider them as agents? What they can, what, actually they could do and did do. And what do you gain from all history when you go to people, simple people and listen to their stories? Yeah, thank you for uh, this question. Uh, the, the, though I described the, the life of uh, people, uh, particularly in the first decade after the establishment of Israel as a life under fear and under military control, uh, people uh, did uh, uh, find ways for resilience, for, for uh, not accepting uh, everything that the government want to do to them. And it started <clears throat> actually during the war itself. We find during the war itself that uh, the army comes, expel people of a village or most of them, and tell them uh, to go to the north, to Lebanon. And they start to go because if they will not do it, they will shoot them. And many times the army uh, did shoot uh, four or 10 people before the expulsion order uh, for the people. And uh, people were afraid and frightened and they, they started moving north. And after the army left them, did not go after them, they found ways how to go back to the village. That's the case of Majd al of Bani, of Deir al-Assad, of Nahif. All those villages are close to my village, Majd al and in many other cases. Uh, now, people who were expelled, like my family, like my father, he was expelled uh, after uh, the census in, in the village in, in uh, uh, December uh, 48. We were expelled in January 49. So he had already uh, numbers of ID uh, card for himself, his wife, and myself. Uh, and we weren't the only ones. The, there were a dozen and hundreds of the people who were expelled. They, 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 they were you know, registered in the, in the cedulos. So those people found ways how to come back by land or by sea. And some of them went to the court uh, uh, to the high court, to the Bagats, and said, uh, we were expelled in this date. Uh, so our expulsion was illegal because even there was no order, uh, formal order for expulsion of the people or why the, the army expelled those people. And like the people of Ekrit and Berem, the well-known story of Ekrit and Berem, uh, who were expelled uh, inside uh, the Galilee, but many others were expelled outside the Galilee, like my family, and they found ways uh, to come back uh, and, and, and struggled in order uh, to stay uh, in their villages, in their homes. So, so I find in, this in these stories, uh, agency of the people, they are not only victims, they are finding ways from time to time difficult as it is uh, to, uh, you know, to, to stay put uh, and uh, not to accept uh, their fate as victims only, uh, but to live their life, to survive, and to try to build a, a new life after the catastrophe for their children. 
Now, concerning the oral history, uh, it's, it's completing the, the, what I said earlier about the agency of the people uh, in, in the field. Uh, it's very important uh, to hear those stories from the people and to hear other stories also of atrocities, of, of uh, massacres and expulsions in the Galilee not only about the fact that they were expelled and the fact that there was a massacre in Elabun or in Majdar Krum and in other places, but also how the people felt, how they behaved, what did, did they do, how they came back. All those stories are not written neither in documents of the army nor in Jewish memoirs uh, or uh, uh, other sources, uh, formal sources, that uh, generally the historian uh, and particularly historians like Benny Morris who don't believe in oral history when it comes to the uh, Palestinian side, he would not say something like that about the Jewish history that he, he doesn't believe in oral history if we speak about what the Nazis did uh, to, uh, to the Jews. Uh, but uh, for Palestinians, he does say that he does say that and he is popular among uh, some people because he's saying that. So, so, so uh, uh, letting the silent people speak, the marginalized, uh, writing a bottom up history uh, 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 by listening to the people and telling their stories is one of the important uh, aims of this book. Okay, um, now I have a last one last question before we go to the Q and A. And it's also a big question, so you decide okay. how to. You also have a lot of uh, criticism on the Arab leadership, a lot of criticism on the communist uh, party, particularly on the Arab communists, on the Palestinian communists. You have a lot of criticism also on the on Hajjamin al Husseini, and you also have a criticism on the Arab League of that time. So can you summarize, and you, at the point even you say that till today, uh, the Arabs did not have a fundamental, uh, or perhaps not till today, a fundamental critical historical analysis of, of uh, or, or, or a, a, a account of, of, of what happened. Uh, so, I mean, now I'm putting together in one question because we are short of time, all the critique and you have very harsh critique on various sides. And as I said, even of the telling on the story, which was not yet so critical yet in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense of, of critical history. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's really uh, one big uh, question with actually three questions uh, put together. Uh, and I try, I try to answer in brief. Uh, I do believe until today, and it's not only my belief, but others also, that until today, actually, we don't have a good comprehensive account from the Palestinian side uh, of the story of the Nakba, which is the import, most important event in their history uh, in, in modern times. And the reasons for that uh, are many. Uh, and I, I don't have time now uh, 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 to tell them uh, from not having uh, archives to the issue of democracy or uh, freedom uh, of speech and writing in the, in the Arab states. Uh, no Palestinians, for instance, can tell the, the uh, uh, or speak about the role of the Hashemite uh, kingdom, Abdullah, King Abdullah, uh, in the war and in the Nakba. Uh, and that's why, the, in the same token, uh, the communists uh, were mad on me, or some of them at least, not all of them, uh, were mad on me because I came up uh, with what they did and what they said in 48. Uh, they, they built a narrative of heroism, that they were heroes in, in 48 that they, they, it's true that they accepted the uh, partition plan in 47, but that was a kind of heroism that they, 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 uh, by this way, by doing that, uh, and uh, they, they uh, secured life for many people and that the communists 
I'm speaking mainly now about the Arab communists in the, in the North, led by three people, Fuad Nassar, Emil Habibi, and uh, Tawfiq Toubi, uh, that uh, the communists actually uh, stopped expulsion in, 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 in the Galilee. And they were heroes and so on and so forth. Now, I found out that actually the communists were kind of collaborators uh, with the uh, Zionist state. If you ask Jewish communists, they, they said for sure, they are proud in their role in fighting for establishing of, for, of the state of Israel in 48. And when my, when my book was published in Arabic and Hebrew, uh, uh, while uh, the Jewish communists said, Adelmanna is right. He's telling the real story of what the communists did in 48. For Palestinians, uh, communists who are not proud today or 20 years ago in what they did in 48, because they thought Israel will become a socialist country, a friend of, the, of uh, Moscow, of the, of the communist bloc, uh, and they were disappointed after that. Uh, this is a story that they, they, they want just to forget. Uh, so this is my criticism of the communists, which is a criticism of the false narrative that they built and marketed uh, among Palestinians uh, from 56 on. They, uh, that's why they don't write anything about their role between uh, 48 and 56. Now, concerning the uh, Palestinian leadership, uh, my criticism is uh, similar, but uh, different in the same time. I mean, uh, the way the Palestinian leadership, uh, mainly the Jerusalemite leadership, of the Nashashibis and the Husseinis uh, led the struggle for independence, for self-determination, and so on and so forth, uh, from the 20s on, was a failure. I mean, the factionalism, the division uh, between the two parties, and in the 30s, in the, during the rebellion of 36, 39, it became even a bloody struggle between the two factions. Uh, thousands of people were killed uh, by uh, 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 rebels or uh, people of Hajamir Husseini and, and others. Uh, and uh, this factionalism, uh, this loss of unity of the Palestinians when they needed uh, the unity against the British and against uh, the Zionist, uh, 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 you know, uh, the Zionist policies uh, was a, a big failure, not only in the 30s, but also uh, uh, the same thing happened on the eve uh, of the war. They failed in 47. Uh, they failed politically first uh, uh, because the partition plan is a failure of leadership of the Palestinians and the Arab League, and at the Arab League here. Uh, but nonetheless, they continued their internal struggles. They continued their uh, uh, bloody internal struggle rather than uniting the people uh, for a war, which is, is an existential war. Uh, they didn't understand uh, that uh, it's an existential war. And they, in the same time that they say they are against the partition plan, they didn't prepare their people for a war, for an existential war. The Palestinian people was not uh, at all uh, ready for that war, but uh, they let the war uh, continue depending on the Arab League, on the Arab states, when they knew exactly what King Abdullah wanted. He wanted to share Palestine with the Zionist uh, or Israeli state. And that's what he did in, uh, during 48. Rather than fighting uh, Israel, he, 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 his, his army actually fought against Palestinian guerrillas in, in the war uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, so in brief, uh, my, my criticism to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Palestinian leadership uh, is, uh, is the failure of leadership uh, is the, that they didn't tell their people the truth about their realities. 
and about their future. Uh, they were afraid to say that or because of the, I don't know, uh, the other reasons. And the result was a, a, a Nakba, a catastrophe uh, in 48, in which both the Palestinian and Arab regimes, the Palestinian leadership and Arab regimes had a role. I mean, it's a, a partial role, uh, not the important one. However, uh, Palestinian historians should deal with that role, what the Palestinian leadership did or did not, whether they could have behaved differently and so on. And those questions are not answered. And now I'll move to a call to the, uh, thank you Adel uh, for this, uh, I encourage everybody to read the book because all those uh, points that you share with us throughout this uh, conversation are elaborated much more in the book, uh, which is really, I read it in Hebrew when it came out, it's a little bit different uh, the English, but it's a fascinating and eye-opening book. But I now I want to ask, I mean, the, the, to create one big, again, one big question out of many questions in the Q&A that came here. Don't you tell a, a biased story here when on the one hand, uh, Israel in the, uh, in the uh, Declaration of Independence also granted, uh, spoke about um, uh, uh, rights, equal rights and social rights to the old people about peace was a, is a kind of a democratic declaration. We see today that uh, 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 70 years or 75 years later that uh, Palestinian Arabs, I mean, this is the question, are integrating in the medical system, the, in courts, even in high tech. And on the other hand, as you mentioned, perhaps uh, more Palestinians were killed by Arabs in Syria or in, in uh, later on or in, 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 uh, in Jordan. Um, so can you, do you think those elements uh, which you did not talk about, somehow make the picture, the story a little bit different. I'm accumulating several critical questions into one, uh, one big yeah. question. Yeah, thank you for this, this uh, critical approach uh, to <laughs> in this question. Uh, well, my book is not about what happened uh, to the Palestinians after 56. And my book is not uh, about uh, the uh, Palestinians uh, before the Nakba. It tells the story of the Nakba and survival, and in particular place in, in, in the Galilee. So it's, it's not a comprehensive story of uh, what happened to the Palestinians how, and how the Palestinians behaved, or what the Arab regimes did to the Palestinians uh, after the Nakba. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, by doing this, I, I, I wanted uh, to uh, tell a different story uh, from what uh, uh, both sides, the Israeli side and the Arab side, wrote or did not write uh, about uh, the Palestinians. Uh, uh, I mean, it is uh, well known now that this is the first book uh, the first historical account of the uh, Palestinians who remained in Israel during the war and uh, the decade uh, in the aftermath. Uh, there is no other book uh, telling this story of the Palestinians who remained. The, uh, the Israeli side uh, who wrote uh, about uh, those same topics either are dealing with the war and the questions of uh, the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem, whether expelled, ethnic cleansing, or differently, the, what are the reasons for that? Uh, and uh, almost nothing uh, about the Palestinians in Israel. Uh, they even, uh, those historians don't answer the question, what are the real reasons that this minority remained and what are the circumstances that they remain and i'm trying to tell the story and by telling the story of those who were remained 
uh, I'm actually telling the other side of the coin why others were not able to remain in the gallery and elsewhere. Uh, and then telling uh, the, the history of this minority in Israel from their point of view, not from the point of view of the policy of the government, but from their point of view, what, uh, uh, how, how they survived under military control or martial law, uh, as, as you describe it. Uh, now, uh, I don't think it, I, I don't think it's it biased at all. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I did indicate that this is the story of uh, those these people, the, the remnants of the Palestinians in Israel. Uh, I'm telling the story from the point point of view. That doesn't mean that it's uh, it, it, it's not uh, objective. It means that uh, for the first time, the silent people, the people who were frightened by the Israeli policies uh, after 48 are able for the first time to tell their story. I mind you, uh, when I interviewed many people in the Galilee, 70 years or 60 something years after the Nakba and uh, 50 years after the military control, some of those elder people were afraid to tell their story. I had to go to the same village and to the same people once and again, and to tell them my own story and my, the story of our village, uh, Majdal Krum, the, the massacre and the expulsion and how the, we became refugees and came back. Uh, if they didn't know me before, it took me time uh, to interview them several times until they told me the real story, what happened there. There were other cases, communists, for instance, wanted to speak more because they thought they were heroes, that they did the right thing. But some of them, when I asked them questions about things that uh, they didn't like and they didn't like to, uh, they wanted to forget, as I said earlier, they said, well, we are not leaders. We didn't know about this. It's the leaders who decided and we politically, we couldn't make a difference and so on and so forth. So again, uh, uh, if you read this book and compare it uh, to other books uh, which deal uh, both in macro and in micro, uh, history uh, with this topic, uh, uh, I mean, honestly, uh, I say that uh, it is a, 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 an objective account from the point of view of the Palestinians. Uh, it's, it's not a Zionist uh, account, for sure. Uh, it's, uh, it's an account from, from the point of view of the victims of the ethnic cleansing policy and of the policy of oppression and the depression put on the Palestinians after 48 until today. Now, for as, as you say, uh, today the things are different. That's true. Uh, uh, after 66, there, there was a change uh, in the policy uh, of the Israeli government toward uh, a, a Palestinian minority in Israel. But look what happens uh, today in the West Bank, for instance, and ask people, what, what, do, what do they know about what Israel is doing there? And you'll see that most of the Israeli uh, public uh, will support and even ask for more harsh policies toward the Palestinians. Nobody is speaking about the settler colonial system, the apartheid system, uh, and actually in, in 4866, the, the system, in Israel itself was an apartheid system because there were two uh, different uh, administrations, uh, political and other, on Jews and Arabs. Jews had a, 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 a set of rights which the Palestinians didn't have in Israel until 1966. Things became better uh, in day-to-day -day life, but until today, uh, the life of the Palestinians, as you know, because of other reasons, for instance, the killing of people and what the, what the police is doing or what the government is doing for this question. If, if that number of Jews was killed uh, by criminals, uh, I mean, 
no government can you know survive mm. uh, uh, the criticism of uh, of uh, such a thing yeah um I, I, uh, thank you very much adel and also bringing us to the book itself and to the period i have two we have like our time is running really really short so i have two questions and try to be brief on them so we can and then that and then we'll finish one is one is asking about the massacre in your village and he puts massacre in quotation marks so what it really briefly describe the phenomena of massacres and what do you actually call a massacre two people killed or what, what is the massacre in, in your eyes Okay, uh, uh, I decided uh, to call massacres uh, or, uh, or a massacre uh, an event in which uh, soldiers or uh, a militia, uh, people uh, who have weapons killed uh, civilians, not during fight or occupation, uh, uh, but rather after or uh, uh, killing people uh, during surren surrender or occupation of a village when those people surrendered and have had no weapon and uh, were not endangering in any way uh, those soldiers. So in the Galilee, uh, uh, mind you, just in the upper Galilee, there were uh, 14 massacres in a short time of a week or more uh, that the army did, that the army, uh, uh, you know, uh, made those uh, massacres in order uh, to uh, frighten the people and let them go. Now, in, in the case of uh, the massacre in Mardal Krum, which, which happened <coughs> a week after the surrender of the village, uh, and transferring all of their weapons to the army according to the agreement, the army came again. Uh, and ask all the people to come to the square, main square in the in the uh, center of the village, and they 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 claimed that they know that some people did not uh, give their uh, weapons to the army. Uh, just a claim, and all the people of the village said, "No, we did uh, surrender. We did give all the army uh, arms that we had, uh, but the officer." It seems that who, who had a, a clear uh, orders from somewhere uh, to frighten people, <coughs> told the people that within an hour, if he will not see weapons, uh, he will start killing uh, one man each half an hour. And that's what he did. <coughs> uh, 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 the officer, Khawaja uh, Ghazal uh, or uh, Tzvi Rabinovich from the Shai, from uh, uh, the Haganah, uh, was telling somebody he spoke Arabic, come here. They blinded him, put him on the wall, and six soldiers get order from the officer, shoot. And all the six shoot that uh, uh, guy and killed him. <clears throat> and then after half an hour, they did the same. And, uh, and this execution of people with no reason uh, have no other aim but to frighten the people. And it happened really that about third of the people, particularly the young people, left the village, went to the mountains uh, after that massacre in Majdal Krum. <clears throat> and uh, other massacres, in, in, in other villages, whether in Elabun or in, in other villages, uh, their aim is not to kill, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of people, but rather to frighten the people in order to get rid of the population. That's the aim uh, of those massacres uh, in the Galilee. Sometimes <clears throat> the army killed 70 people, 80 people, but many times they killed uh, seven or ten, uh, like in Majdal Krum and Dailabun. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, way of defining what is a massacre is the United Nations uh, uh, definition, which is the killing of 
four, five or more citizens by the army, not during war or uh, fights or, uh, or, or fight uh, war events, but rather uh, uh, after uh, and not during occupation, but after occupation of surrender of those uh, citizens. Um, okay, one last, last question. We have many more, but one last question, which is more uh, methodological, and okay. I think it might be interesting. Um, you focus on the oral testimonies, but would you like to uh, uh, answer a uh, brief? You found other ways in which people try to express their stories, paintings or memoirs or other, and how do they contribute to your uh, analysis and to your historical account? Uh, very brief. Yeah. Uh, Paintings. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Toward the end, that you are asking me this question because it's very important. Uh, uh, it, it's telling a lot about uh, this book, which is different from other books, whether are new historians or uh, old historians who wrote about the Nakba and after. You know, I this I I decided to go to the field and to listen to the people. Because I myself, before becoming historian, and after I have started to study history in Haifa and later on in the Hebrew University, I found out that there is different information in the field from the information that uh, we have or we know about it in the archives and the books. And uh, <clears throat> that's why I decided to go uh, to the silent people, uh, to marginalized people, to the victims, uh, to hear their story, not in order many times, <clears throat> in, uh, in order to have different numbers or uh, account of the events in, in, in the places, but many times to listen to the people and to hear their story, how they felt, how they behaved, how they returned, how they found strength to, uh, for resilience and so on and so forth. And that was uh, very important uh, to let those people become agents of their story and not only victims of their story. Okay, I mean, there are many more questions and I myself restrict myself from asking more questions, but our time is up and actually we over uh, passed it. So thank you very, very, very much, uh, Adele. And thank you for joining us uh, for this conversation. And I, I think uh, next year we will come, uh, the two institutes will join hands together in another series of encounters on a different topic. So thank you all. Thank you, Alon, uh, if thank you are you. listening. Uh, and and, <clears throat> and um, speedy recovery. And thank you, Adele. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Amos.